Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan, and today I'd like to talk about Peter Grimes uh, by Benjamin Britten. And I'd like to go through this great opera composed in the mid 20th century, just pulling apart the music really, just seeing how the music interacts with the text and looking at some of the structures in this marvellous work. I do believe that when you really uh, get to grips and listen carefully to a piece of music, it can greatly aid our appreciation and enjoyment of it. That's why I do these videos. And if this is your kind of thing, please click like and subscribe. Now, Benjamin Britten in the early 1940s was living in the United States with Peter Piers, the, the tenor and his uh, lifelong partner. And um, Benjamin Britten came across this second-hand copy of The Borough, which is this poem published in 1810 by the English poet George Crabbe. Britton hadn't read this before, but he was beguiled by it. Um, this long narrative poem spoke of life in a small fishing town on the Suffolk coast. And of course, Britton was from that area of England. There's a portion in the poem in particular which really inspired him, which is about this rather nasty fisherman called Peter Grimes and uh, Peter Grimes keeps getting these boy apprentices um, murdering them uh, before he's finally brought to task by the townsfolk and uh, Peter Grimes seemed to be a figure that that struck uh, Britain and indeed Peter Pears as well. After reading the poem he said I'd feel inspired to do two things to go home back to England and to write my first full-length opera and to help him with that decision Serge Kusevitsky who's a champion of contemporary music in the 20th century he said here's a thousand pounds he offered him a commission to go and write this opera on the way back to England on the ship um, a long journey of course Britain and Pierce fleshed out the the scenario for this opera and uh, when they got back to England, they um, enlisted the help of Montague Slater, uh, the poet, to write the libretto based on Crabbe's poetry. The opera was uh, worked on during 1944 predominantly and it was premiered on June the 7th, 1945 at the Sadler's Well Theatre in London. Reginald Goodall was the conductor and Peter Pears himself sang the role of Peter Grimes. It was a resounding success, both critically and publicly, and it really um, made Britain a household name in the classical music world. The opera became a mainstay of uh, British opera houses, but of course also in continental Europe, which is quite rare for uh, any work by a British composer, as well as further afield, including the United States, where it's premiered by Leonard Bernstein. Now, I love Peter Grimes. I think it's just an amazing opera. It's one of my favourite operas. Why? Well, for a start, it's not boring. <laughs> you know, there's no dull patches in this opera. Um, it just engages you and you're involved with the drama from the opening bars of the prologue all the way through to the final bars of Act 3. And it's just full of these great set pieces, which are perhaps vestiges of uh, the grand opera tradition. And although Peter Grimes is in a mid-20th century uh, modern idiom, although it's very accessible, it has to be said, it's, it's nothing like serial music, for instance. It's, it's, got, it's, very, uh, it's very easy to listen to, um, Peter Grimes, in, in some respects. Um, but despite its modernity, it does have this, uh, these conventions in. It has the, uh, the great, great set pieces, you know, with the chorus, such as Old Joe has gone fishing and uh, Grimes is at his exercise, etc. It has achingly beautiful arias, the Great Bear and the Pleiades, for instance. It has a storm scene, really exciting. It has a mad scene, even. Um, at the end. And of course, perhaps the most famous feature of this opera are the sea interludes. 
ostensibly to cover the breaks between scene changes, but they are beautifully poetic evocations of the sea, each one of them. There's six interludes. The sea very much is the hidden character in this opera. Um, it doesn't speak any lines, but you hear it all the time. And uh, Britain, through his masterful orchestration, just conjures up a kaleidoscope of, of imagery connected to the sea in its various guises. I've done a, a separate video actually on the four sea interludes which are published separately to the, the opera so please check that out. And um, down below in the description I've broken each of the, the acts into its constituent parts uh, with bar numbers so if you wish to follow the four mo more closely it's down there in the description. Now the opera's in three acts with a prologue. It's set in uh, this fishing town, the borough it's called, which to all intents and purposes is Aldborough. It's on the east coast of England by the sea and the year is approximately 1830. Now the opera begins uh, straight into the prologue. There's no overture or anything. Uh, and we're in the Moot Hall, which is this, uh, this town hall and uh, there's a coroner's inquest. Um, Peter Grimes has been summoned here, he's a fisherman, and his latest apprentice, William Spode, this young boy, uh, has died while they were on the seas. And uh, Peter Grimes is called into the dock. And we begin um, with this, this melody, uh, which we hear throughout the opera, which kind of represents the townsfolk. Um, it goes like this. Britain, of course, is a master at um, evoking characters and groups of people in his music. And there's something of the, uh, the kind of busybodiness, the kind of um, the nosiness uh, and the closed uh, insularity of, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this small town in that tune. Now, Swallow is like the local bigwig. He's like the lawyer. And he makes Peter um, Grimes swear on the Bible. And even at the beginning of this opera, in this prologue, as Peter swears, I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give, even as he sings that, he's, he's not allowed to finish his line before he's interrupted by Swallow. It's quite telling that already, from the very first um, lines, Peter Grimes hasn't been given the time to explain himself. Um... So Peter's questioned by Swallow about what happened. It turns out that Grimes's boat was blown off course um, and they were stuck out in the seas, him and William Spode, his, his young apprentice, for three days and um, they ran out of drinking water and tragically the young boy died. Peter Grimes got rid of his catch and brought the, uh, the body back to shore where there were several witnesses in the town who were also in the hall. There's just general hubbub in the hall with all the, the, the kind of townsfolk eager to listen in and to uh, see what's going on. We have this idea which represents the gossip of the townsfolk. Underneath that, we hear the, the townsfolk gossiping already in this town hall. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, it's beautifully scored, very effectively scored. Uh, the orchestra and the chorus coming in uh, there with this general feeling and this air of, of hubbub, of hullabaloo. Swallow then delivers his verdict to that, uh, that tune we heard right at the beginning of the prologue. Your 
I love the way um, there in the score uh, swallows uh, as he delivers the verdict at that point when he sings died it's mezzo voce kind of died in accidental circumstances I think that's really lovely we hear more of the gossiping crowds and uh, although Peter's acquitted and um, it's seen as a tragic accident this death Peter's not happy he wants to really put to bed these malicious rumours these this gossip mongering going on about him he wants the time and the space to explain himself in front of the townsfolk but he's not given that luxury Grimes is not listened to by anybody with the perhaps the exception of Ellen Orford and we meet her next at the end of the prologue as the crowd is dismissed we're left with Peter Grimes and Ellen Orford. Ellen Orford is a, a widowed schoolmistress and she's the only person who's prepared to be Peter's friend. Um, indeed, she's offering Peter to start a new life with her elsewhere, away from the, uh, the malicious townsfolk, the gossiping harridans of the borough. And um, we have this touching moment in this recitative-like um, passage at the end uh, where we hear where they sing together in unison into the first C interlude. Dawn. This music's so beautiful, but so eerie and strange as well. There's something of the inhumanity of the rolling sea in this music as dawn breaks. It's made up of three ideas which are repeated and varied. And I'll just remind you, you can see the form uh, down below. So we have that idea. The violin's very high in the flutes. new more busy idea the waves coming in on the harps violas and clarinets <laughs> a masterful evocation of the sea at dawn. Act one begins imperceptibly from this first sea interlude. As those high violin grace notes. They uh, gradually form this sequence of notes. chorus begins. The village, the town, the borough is waking up for a new day. And um, this act really is um, all about Peter Grimes um, getting a new boy apprentice. But um, at the beginning of the act, as the, the, the townsfolk uh, awaken, 
they sing this song. Oh, hang it open doors, then let the cold. While squalid sea dames at the mending work. And uh, the, the chorus sings this gentle melody. And over the top we keep hearing these notes. And uh, there's this bitonality here from those high notes, which is in F, with the, the chorus, which is A, A major. This chorus forms the bulk actually of this opening section of Act One. We do have a couple of um, interludes, short interludes, brief interludes, where we meet other prominent members of the borough. We meet uh, Bellstrode, who's a retired merchant skipper, um, who is somewhat sympathetic to Grimes. Um, and we meet Auntie and her two nieces. Auntie is the kind of landlady of the boar, the pub. She's also a kind of madame and uh, her two nieces kind of sell their bodies um, to many of the men at night time. We meet the rector. We actually met him briefly in the prologue, um, Horace Adams and um, Mrs. Sedley, who's like this old busybody. Uh, and we also meet Ned Keane, who's an apothecary and a quack. He's able to source kind of pills and stuff that people might require, including Mrs. Sedley. And uh, finally, we also meet uh, Bob Bowles, who's like this uh, real Bible thumping, born again Christian. So uh, yeah, we get to meet some of the, the main uh, characters during this opening chorus. Eventually this early morning reverie is broken and Peter calls from the sea. Hold the boat. Haul it yourself, Grimes, Bowles shouts. Um, so Grimes is being pulled upon the shore uh, and we have this kind of winding uh, of the windlass as uh, Bellstrode, um, Ned Keen and Auntie uh, help Grimes ashore. And uh, we have this aria, I suppose. Um, I'll give a hand, the tide is near the turn. Once Peter Grimes uh, is pulled upon the shore, Ned Keane, this Spiv-like character, um, kind of seems to have his hand in many different pies, a bit of a shady uh, character. He has this new apprentice um, sourced for Grimes at the local workhouse. And Hobson, who's like this carrier, he eventually agrees to get the boy. And Ellen Orford agrees to go with him. And the tune is like this. Well, Keane, Hobson and uh, Ellen Orford arrange to get this boy. The crowd around them are getting restless. What's going on? Uh, what's Ellen Orford doing getting involved with this Peter Grimes? And then Ellen stands up and delivers a stunning rebuke to their hostility and their prejudice. 
Let her among you without fault cast the first stone. Which of course is a quote from St John's Gospel. We have this tune. This is a, a cry from the heart from Ellen in, um, in defence of Peter Grimes. I love the contrary motion. We then come to this thrilling moment in Peter Grimes in the, the first act where um, the borough hears a storm approach. And the storm, of course, in 1830, on the eastern coast of England by the North Sea, that can spell trouble. And um, we have this dramatic introduction before we have this thrilling fugue. And this is one of the great set pieces of this opera. Listen to this. This is just thrilling contrapuntal writing, uh, so virtuosic. And um, if you know Elgar's Dream of Garontius, it, it does remind me of um, the, the Demon's Chorus from that oratorio. Uh, but yeah, which Britain, of course, uh, conducted and recorded. But yeah, absolutely uh, amazing stuff. And uh, amongst that hullabaloo of the, uh, the orchestra and the chorus, this rhythm eventually begins to cry out above everything else. Thrilling writing. Soon we're just left with Balstrode and, um, and Peter Grimes. And Balstrode saying to Grimes, look, why don't you get out of here? A bit like Ellen Orford before. Get out of here, start somewhere else. Work in the Merchant Navy or something. But then Peter tells him uh, by this aria, by familiar fields, how he feels rooted um, to the borough, this locality. Grimes is an outsider, yes, but he still feels that this is very much where his heart lies, by the sea on the east coast of England. My This is stormy music which doesn't settle uh, for long in a key before it moves along, uh, reflecting Grimes' uh, heart and, his, and you can sense his uh, state of mind unravelling as well. We get to another section which to my mind sounds like a melody from Mahler's Fifth Symphony. I know uh, Britain admired Mahler but we hear this melody when uh, Grimes sings We Strained. Um, so we hear these these flurries going up in the in the flute. Do we hear this tune? We strained into the wind. Yeah, it's definitely Mahler's Fifth as a tune, isn't it? If you know that uh, simply. Um, or maybe it's a coincidence, I don't know. Peter now is getting very worked up. And um, 
he is um, obsessing over the villagers. He wants to prove himself. And the way he can prove himself is by fishing the oceans dry, setting up shop and proving himself as a kind of top dog, um, earning loads of money. They listen to money, that's what he says. They listen to money. In this contrasting section, Largamente, um, Peter stands alone and he, he has this brief moment of hope and peace. He has this vision of what peace might be like, what harbour shelters peace. And uh, we hear this tune in the following interlude and uh, a little bit later in the opera as well. And then we're brought into the second sea interlude, The Storm, uh, which is such a thrilling piece of music, one of the best evocations of a storm ever. And um, you could say it's in two uh, broad sections. The first one, um, in a very gloomy um, E flat minor. Well, you can see my other video on this uh, about the four C interludes for more detail about this. But the uh, the, con the main contrasting section um, again is that tune we just heard Peter Grimes sing about the hope, about his yearning for for peace, and uh, we hear that again. Um, The storm sea interlude crashes into scene two where the door is flung open and Mrs. Sedley, this old busybody who's waiting for her pills from Ned Key, is brought into the boar pub. The wind is at hurricane force outside. The boar is auntie's domain. She's the landlady with her two nieces who await their patrons. And we have, um, at the beginning of this scene, various villagers coming in, seeking refuge from the storm. Uh, in this incredibly exciting recitative uh, section, we have the storm music raging away, contrasting with um, the sheer terror and confusion of the inhabitants of the borough sheltering in the Boar pub. Now, pretty soon after Bellstrode comes in, he's... Uh, He's not a big fan of Auntie, he starts criticising her. And um, Auntie has this uh, aria where she stands her ground against Bellstrode. Loud man. Loud man, I never did have time For the kind of creatures who fit in his wine. Then we have this kind of jaunty bit. A joke's a joke and fun is fun. Da -da. Da, 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 da. What I love about this aria is there's a second section, a contrasting section, where we hear the two nieces and Mrs. Sedley, who's horrified at being in this pub waiting for her pills, I have this really great um, kind of imitative uh, texture going on. And it's just so cool. Have a listen to this. <laughs> Love that for his peace of mind. Then uh, Bowles comes in. Remember him? He's the kind of uh, Bible bashing preacher, and he um, 
he's a bit worse for wear. He's had he's drank too, he's drunk too much, and uh, he starts trying it on with the nieces, and he gets a bit out of hand. Balstrode comes in and uh, puts him in his place. He starts singing an aria. Pub conversation should depend on this eternal moral. We have this uh, this bit. And then Peter enters and he's raving. He's, uh, he's not quite uh, right now. He's, his mind is confused. Um, the storm has, uh, is very much a reflection of what's going on in Peter's heart and mind. And uh, Keane reports that the cliff has collapsed uh, up by Grimes' hut. And Grimes sings this really uh, beautiful uh, Aria, now the great bear and the Pleiades are drawing up the clouds of human grief, breathing solemnity in the deep night. Such a, a moment of repose in this this volatile scene, and so beautiful, like the, the way the strings fall down. They're like tears coming down. Very beautiful. We now come to one of my absolute favourite moments in uh, this opera. Um, old Joe has gone fishing. Um, to keep their spirits up um, amidst the storm, they decide to sing around a kind of a sea shanty. Conslancio, uh, Britain writes in the score. And I just love it. Old Joe has gone fishing, and young Joe has gone fishing, and you know who's gone fishing, and bring them a shawl. What's so brilliant about that is the, the meter. Um, it's in seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, 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 seven. Old Joe has gone fishing, and young Joe has gone fishing, and you know has gone fishing and brought them a shoal. That off kilter meter brings this whole set piece alive. It's such an irresistible, a drunken uh, energy to it. Uh, and then allied to that in this in this round, we have this a, a counter subject. Um, and then uh, the way they they combine with the orchestra is just electrifying. Brilliant, isn't it? Uh, Grimes comes in, but he kind of um, is all over the place and he's raving over the top of this round. He's sounding really crazy. And then right at the end of this scene, at the end of this act, the apprentice is brought in, in through the storm, into the boar pub, uh, escorted by Ellen Orford. Uh, she wants to warm the boy up. He's, uh, he's chilled to the bone, as auntie says. And um, all hell is breaking loose outside. The bridge is down. And um, despite the fact Peter's hut is washed away, um, or the cliff has at least collapsed by his hut, Peter, despite the extreme weather, 
roughly and coarsely takes the boy out into the, the rain and the howling wind and uh, takes him away from the warmth and safety of the pub, much to everyone's shock and disgust. And then this scene ends unforgettably with these crashing E minor chords. Now act two um, is really building up to the death of the new apprentice, John, who um, dies um, in a, again in a terrible accident. Act two begins with the third C interlude. Um, which describes Sunday morning. Um, we have the church bells ringing in with these horn calls. Something like that. Da, 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 da. Like the kind of uh, the sun uh, glinting off the uh, the tops of the waves on a on a brilliant sunny morning. Wonderful uh, splash of colour there. We even have these kind of the bluesy notes in there as well. With these E flats. We then have this new this more lyrical idea in this interlude. Uh, we first hear on the, uh, the violas and cellos. And uh, it's just an interlude, just an alternation of those uh, ideas. Um, but the climax is uh, just terrific with, with this um, kind of uh, motor rhythm, uh, almost in a minimalist style. It's so great when we hear the, the, the horns kind of tolling the bells. Being supplemented by these real crashing bells at that moment. Now you could argue that um, when Ellen uh, comes on to the scene with John, the new apprentice boy, um, it's still, the, the, inter the music of the interlude still going on. And... Uh, she sings Glitter of waves and glitter of sunlight uh, based on that tune we've heard already the second tune in the uh, interlude and um, she's with John they're skipping church to spend some time by the beach uh, Ellen has grown rather fond of this boy then we have this this scene where we hear the church service going on led by the rector and at the same time, Ellen notices um, in this, this beautiful morning, Ellen suddenly notices a bruise on John's neck. Um, and she realizes that um, Peter's been rough with this boy as he had been to other boys before. It's interesting in this opera, although Peter is the outsider and you tend to kind of feel for him in his the way he's been ostracized there's no getting around the fact that he is he does treat his children badly and um and that ambiguity uh, is at the heart of the opera it's, that's what helps makes this such a great work so ella notices this bruise and um i'll just play the opening of this
so effective, isn't it, hearing that um, that church service going on in the background while the drama between Ellen and John the, the Apprentice goes on. Now, as um, Ellen inspects the, the boy's neck and sees the bruise, um, Mrs Sedley, who's um, left the church early, as sees what's going on. And uh, remember, she's this nosy busybody. And uh, Mrs Sedley soon begins to gossip about this bruise on this child's neck. It's this that um, begins the witch hunt, which uh, ends this act. Uh, Grimes then comes along and meets with Ellen and uh, John the boy. As he comes, we hear this, uh, this more lively hymn. So this boy is not getting a morning off. He's uh, been summoned by Peter to go off fishing, much to Ellen's uh, dismay and disappointment. She really wants to spend time with this boy. Pretty soon Ellen questions Peter about where this child got his bruise, what happened. And um, this is a powerful moment in the, uh, in the, uh, in the scene because um, uh, it's helped by um, this repeated rhythm, which we hear in the horns. Ellen brings home to Peter how his old ways will destroy their relationship in building a future together. Peter hits Ellen in this, uh, at this terrible climax. Thrillingly dramatic, isn't it? A foretaste of the Passacaglia, which comes later in the act. Dum, 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 dum. Auntie, Ned and Bowles, who've been watching all this take place, this drama between um, Ellen and Grimes and the boy, they come out and, my goodness me, they're ready to spread some gossip about what they've seen. Grimes is at his exercise. So exciting and so immediate and accessible this music it could almost be from a West End show I think uh, this this part of the opera eventually the, the, the church goers come out of the church and um, they all get to hear about Grimes's latest uh, drama and uh, they all start gossiping as well and uh, we keep returning to Grimes is at his exercise and then as the frenzy builds Bowles, the, the preacher, stands up and he, he's getting involved. And eventually the, um, the music's similar, but the, eventually the, um, the crowd starts to turn on Ellen, Ellen Orford. What's she doing hanging around with Grimes? How is she involved in all this? And she explains herself. Oh, 
other characters uh, throw their own two pence worth in criticising Ellen's motivations. It's only Auntie and Balstrode who have any sympathy for Ellen. The crowd now want blood and uh, they want to go to Grimes's hut. We hear them get worked up into a murderous rage. Back to the gutter! You keep out of this! Only the men, the women, start our hopes of fate. You drop, summon the bubble to drive to spell. Hobson starts banging his drum and uh, he leads a procession to Grimes' hut. They all sing this stark melody as they go. Now is gossip put on trial Now the rumours either fail or a shouted in the wind sweeping furious through the land it's only Bellstrode, ellen auntie and the two nieces who re remain behind and the women folk sing this beautiful quartet Again, a hint of the C in the accompaniment. There's waves swelling. We then come to a, another moment of supreme genius in this opera. This is interlude number four, which is a passacaglia. A passacaglia, of course, is a, um, a kind of theme and variations built on the bass line, used in Baroque music. Um, a famous, another famous example is the, the finale to Brahms' Fourth Symphony, for instance. But um, here we have just such a powerful set of variations, which is built, built on this theme. One of the most expressive viola solos uh, in the repertory. Something of that solo viola um, brings really brings home in such a spine tingling way the loneliness Peter Grimes suffers. And because this is a theme and variation and it just goes round and round, there's something about, there's something in this music which represents Grimes's mind ruminating over the same questions, the same feelings, the same emotions, the same obsessions going round and round and round in his mind. Uh, this Passacaglia really is a work of genius. I won't go through all the variations, but there's one, and remember the forms down below in the description if you want to follow it with the score. But I just love the way Britain scores the brass in this. I'll just hold up the score. One of the variations here, you might be able to see the brass writing. There's these lines. There are these lines, and um, which which go down through the parts and Britain, Britain, Britain creates this amazing swell effect in the brass um, 
these kind of crescendos and diminuendos, these sudden crescendos, sudden diminuendos, again like the waves, almost like a squeeze, the way a squeeze box sounds, you know? Um, have a listen. The way he scores those spread chords, those arpeggiated chords in the brass, is just masterful. The final variation builds up a massive head of steam before we're launched into scene two, which is set in Grimes' hut. In this impassioned, unhinged monologue, he relives the traumatic memory of William Spode, his previous apprentice, dying. There's snatches of previous things he sung earlier on in the opera, such as the They care for money, da 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 da. Um, and he directs his, his fury at the child. Ellen had knitted the child this jumper with an anchor stitched onto it, and Grimes threatens to tear the collar off this, uh, this jumper. He then cheers up because he realises the sea is heaving with fish and he wants to go out and fish so he hauls the boy to his feet and they're about to set sail. But then Hobson's drum is heard in the distance. Grimes knows that the townsfolk are on their way and we begin to hear um, that melody again which we heard before the Passacaglia the kind of marching song. Or a shouted in the wind, sweeping furious through the land. Peter tells um, the young boy John to go out and start to climb down the cliff to the ship. Remember half of um, Peter's hut is washed away. Uh, but then there's a knocking at the door and uh, Peter turns to open the door and he uh, loses sight of John and John falls to his death down the cliff. Peter runs out after the boy and climbs down the cliff um, in panic. The rector Swallow and Ned Keane then come into Grimes' hut and they see everything kind of in order to their surprise. Um, of course Peter or the boy aren't there. And below the ghostly sound of a celesta, the solo viola returns and we hear those fateful notes of the Passacaglia. It's in Act 3 of this extraordinary opera that Grimes takes the only option which he feels is left open to him after the death of the latest boy apprentice. We begin with the, the fifth interlude, a beautiful piece evoking the sea at night. 
with the moonlight shining on the swell of the waves. We begin with this rocking idea. As this idea is repeated round and round, we hear the glint of the moon <clears throat> off the waves. That kind of thing. This music is so beautiful because it builds to such a um, an emotional climax. It's a rather subdued piece, but there's a real heart um, in this music. Um, before we get to scene one. And scene one of this act is, is really, a, um, to begin with, um, a succession of dance tunes. There's a dance in the moot hall and uh, you can hear the band playing inside as various uh, townsfolk stumble out of the hall in varying degrees of intoxication. This reminds me actually of the, the dance music in Alban Berg's Wozzeck, which uh, Britain greatly admired. And uh, there have been parallels drawn between the literary themes between uh, that work and Peter Grimes as well. First of all, it's Swallow and the nieces. They come out. Swallow's clearly looking for a good time as such. We have this kind of tune. As Swallow's chasing the nieces, he kind of disappears into the boar pub and Ned Keane comes out. And Mrs Sedley finds Ned Keane and she starts uh, sharing her concerns about Grimes and the missing boys. They haven't been seen. She knows something bad has happened. And um, we hear this ghostly waltz music from the hall. This really does sound like Wozzeck actually. As Mrs Sedley tries to convince Ned that she believes Grimes has uh, murdered this new apprentice, we hear um, this, this uh, rising chromatic tune, uh, rather untrustworthy and an insinuating melody. Something of the sliminess and the kind of ickiness of Sedley's gossip about that, that little uh, motif. But then the rector comes out of the dance hall, um, again a bit worse for wear with uh, fellow um, town bigwigs. And they're all singing goodnight to each other. Almost sounds like operetta that moment. Eventually, uh, Ellen and Balstro turn up, and um, Mrs. Sedley's kind of lurking in the back background, eavesdropping. <laughs> 
Mrs. Sedley overhears Balstrode and Ellen uh, talking about how they are going to stand by Grimes uh, in his hour of need. And um, of course, Mrs. Sedley, as soon as she hears this, runs off to the boar and starts to gossip. And we have this exciting music. <laughs> Mrs. Sedley whips up a frenzy. Before you know it, in this thrilling moment in this, this act, the, uh, the townsfolk start calling for Grimes' blood. We then come to the final um, scene, um, which is uh, heralded by the sixth interlude, which is basically a recycling ideas we've heard earlier in the opera. We hear the money tune. And we come to um, scene two, which it is the mad scene. Peter Grimes by now is beside himself in torment. He's a... Uh, unhinged. In this expressive scene he imagines, he sees uh, the people, he, the, the apprentices, and uh, we hear snatches of melodies from earlier on in the opera and uh, he begins to hear the people coming to get him. We hear um, his song of hope for the last time. Do you remember this? What hope shelters peace? And then Balstrode and Ellen find him. Balstrode just tells him, look, the only option for you now, Peter, is to take your ship out beyond the horizon and uh, basically sink it and uh, thus killing himself. And... Uh, that's what Peter does. We have the ending to this, uh, this act, indeed the whole opera, whereby the townsfolk awake uh, for, in a new dawn, a new morning, and uh, we have the music of the first sea interlude. <laughs> And we hear that melody again as the, um, the report comes through of, of the ship that has sunk. If you remember that from Act 1. In ceaseless motion comes and goes the tide Flowing it fills the channel bad and white and this opera ends in a very quiet way. So Peter Grimes, an absolute masterpiece by Benjamin Britten. The music is extraordinary, so exciting, so dramatic, and speaks much of how we treat the outsider in society. But like all great works of art, there is ambiguity about who is good and who is bad and Grimes certainly inhabits that grey area which uh, many anti-heroes do of course in all the arts. Thanks for watching this video please click like and subscribe if this is your kind of thing 
And if you'd like me to look at a, a work in particular, please put it in the comments below. All the best. Bye.